Washington, July 13, 1945. My darling Barbara, unless there's an unforeseen foul up now, this will be my last letter for a few days. That damn trip is finally coming up. Bud has been made project supervisor for the procurement program. He's on his way over with Bob Parrish and another cutter. We'll hit about 10 major cities and cover all Bavaria and southern Germany. We may even sneak into the French and British zones. Sometimes I think this job is a few sizes too big for me. The war was over, and a new era in international law was about to begin. The victorious allies held a series of top-level meetings concerning the prosecution of war crimes committed by Nazi Germany. In the summer of 1945, they decided to set up a special court, the International Military Tribunal in the city of Nuremberg. Further meetings were held in London to determine how this unprecedented and landmark trial would function. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic, two young brothers from the U.S. military would soon be embarking on an adventure that would leave a lasting impression on their lives. The youngest, Stuart Schulberg, was only 23 years old at the time. He wrote almost daily to his wife. His brother, Navy Lieutenant Bud Schulberg, was 31. They were assigned a very special mission, to track down and compile film and photographic records of German war crimes. The footage would be used as evidence against 24 high-ranking representatives of the Nazi regime for the upcoming tribunal. They were entrusted with the task by none other than Hollywood director John Ford, now in charge of a film unit for the OSS U.S. Military Intelligence Agency. As the summer of 1945 began, the brothers had just three months to gather evidence of unparalleled crimes against humanity, in the process building the foundations of our collective memory of this infamous period in history. While the material that was presented in Nuremberg is famous today, the mission itself is barely known to the public. During our research, we came across this footage, the sole images of the Schulberg mission known to exist. In the middle is Stuart, the younger of the two brothers. It's the first time his daughter Sandra has seen the pictures. This is an extraordinary find. I've only seen photographs of my father when he was a young man. I've never seen motion pictures of my father. Oh, it's so incredible to see this. I get emotional when I think about how young Stuart was. He was the youngest member of the OSS film team. How shocking it must have been to be seeing these atrocity images over and over again. They had to manipulate this material. They had to watch it, you know, hundreds of times. And yet, I'm also struck by their, their innocence, their, their, their belief that they were doing something very important. And we found further material and information to help in the reconstruction of the mission. Most notably, a lecture given towards the end of his life by Bud Schulberg, who after the war went on to become an Oscar-winning Hollywood screenwriter. He relived key moments of this exceptional journey into world history. I had no idea what I was getting into. And we started, we first started um, getting all the Fox movie tone newsreels, which actually were German films with, with, um, with uh, our uh, American uh, narrations. And we, we ran that in New York City day and night, day and night. To lull the fears of the little neutrals, propaganda minister... After two weeks of intensive work in a studio, the brothers selected around 30 hours of footage before analyzing and indexing the material. This initial selection features film of the first book burnings by the Nazis, as well as a notorious 1935 speech by Hermann Göring in Nuremberg. <laughs> Den 
first trial was set for September 15, and General Bill Donovan, who was the head of OSS, Donovan said, would you, uh, he dropped a bombshell on us and said, by the way, none of that what you did in New York on the Fox movie tone will be acceptable. The trip, the, uh, they're being very strict about this. They don't want to say the film came from the United States. And, they, and, and the um, defense, defense counsel will knock it out. They could say we tampered with the film. So. Since they were not permitted to use footage from back home, the brothers had no choice but to go to Germany in search of the original material used in American newsreel reports. They found a country in ruins. Nuremberg, once an iconic manifestation and platform of Nazi power, was now a ghost town. The Palace of Justice, though damaged, would be the setting for the special tribunal. The chief American prosecutor was Robert Jackson, a justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, who wanted the trial to be the foundation of a future court of international justice. For the first time, the former political leaders of a sovereign state were to be tried in court. The trial would also feature a new kind of testimony, a film projector and screen. Generally, in a common law courtroom, the judges sit at the back of the room, in full view of the defendants and prosecution, with the public sitting across from them. The OSS decided to move the judges and install the screen in their place, making it the focal point of the room. July 16, 1945. Darling, I'm now in Germany. It's odd to be here, crazy to walk down the once Nazi streets, thinking humdrum American thoughts. Only the children are really unchanged. They race around the streets, clamor in and out of the bomb ruins, beg for chocolate, and generally behave like children anywhere. We're beginning to see more and more German soldiers now walking home in their stained Wehrmacht uniforms and their army packs still on their backs. They look exhausted and dirty, and they walk stooped over, avoiding our eyes. The Schulberg brothers were based in a requisitioned villa in the suburbs of Berlin, where they set up an editing suite. One of their first tasks was to examine Triumph of the Will, a bombastic propaganda film made to celebrate the 1934 Nazi party rally in Nuremberg. After first analysis of the film, Bud Schulberg was ordered to find arrest and question Leni Riefenstahl, the film's director and a member of Adolf Hitler's inner circle. The um, party rallies included two valuable things. One was what they actually said at those rallies. And also there were people whose very presence indicted them. People who said that they were just German officials but not necessarily Nazi party related. And uh, showing them with their Nazi badges and things. And Riefenstahl was helpful in, in identifying. With Riefenstahl's help, among the senior Nazi figures identified was Hans Frank, the wartime Nazi governor of Poland and active advocate of exterminating the country's Jewish population. A few weeks later, he would be sitting on the bench in Nuremberg with his fellow defendants. The strategy of the prosecutors was to convict the defendants using their own words and their own uh, recording of their uh, criminal deeds. They had access um, to uh, uh, film that Lenny Riefenstahl and others had shot. So once again, this was the Germans' own presentation of what they were doing. The written word was absolutely inadequate to describing what had happened. 
an ordinary criminal uh, situation. You know, you're walking down the street and someone puts a gun to your uh, chest and demands your money. We can all imagine that. But you couldn't imagine what happened uh, in, in, the, in the Nazi reign of terror. And the only compelling way to do that, I think, really was through film. Among the countless reels of horrific footage found and viewed by the Schulberg team was this film, made by the German army in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1942. The Schulbergs were deeply shocked. The film contained footage of human beings meeting an unspeakable end. Later research in the 90s even confirmed the Nazis used real victims to support their claims of their inferiority. Someone asked me what was almost like the most horrifying moment of all the horrifying moments. And I, I said, I think it, it may be in, the, in that German film on, on Warsaw. They show the dishes where the uh, poor emaciated the bodies are being buried. And they have a cameraman, a German cameraman, right down deep in the pit, shooting up as these emaciated, naked bodies are being thrown past them. They're actually doing their, this is not exposing from the other side, this is them photographing what they were doing, including the most unbelievable, I mean, women with infants were being thrown, just doing this as his job was something that is hard to ever uh, erase from your mind. At the Palace of Justice, preparations were now being accelerated. In the hopes of backing up their claims, Prosecutor Robert Jackson and his team upped the pressure on the Schulberg mission. We were very, very worried about time, but we had no time. So I went down to November to talk with the uh, Jackson legal staff to uh, get the particulars of the indictments and uh, find out specifically how the photographic evidence would dovetail with their actual indictments. From that point on, we worked very closely. They were building a case that Nazis had conspired almost from the beginning, from 1933 on. So they had these many different steps of the indictment of uh, crimes against the uh, crimes against humanity and crimes against the uh, existing peace of the world. While Bud and Stewart were having serious doubts about the success of their mission. Their fortunes took a turn after the emergence of another close confidant of Hitler, the dictator's personal photographer, Heinrich Hoffmann. The brothers and their film editors, including Joe Zygman seen here, had spotted him in one of the German films. Hoffmann was arrested together with other members of the team who had made films for Nazi propaganda minister Josef Goebbels. Following the arrest, Stuart Schulberg was able to take possession of his entire stock of photographs. The 12,000 stills were immediately sent to London to see if they were suitable courtroom evidence. In an attempt to prove good faith on their part, the prisoners provided the American military with valuable information. We learned from them that the SS had its own, own film unit and that they made uh, what they call reports, we would call it atrocities, but it was uh, work that they were very proud of. They told me that uh, these films, they were often two real, two real films, and would be shown at the homes of the Nazi leaders, uh, Goebbels and, and Himmler, Hitler and the rest of them, uh, and they called them uh, des desserts because they showed them as a sort of entertainment af after dinner. Thanks to another tip, Bud Schulberg learned the existence of a secret cache where the Nazis had apparently stored some of their most incriminating films. According to the source, the material was located in a salt mine, nearly 600 meters underground. We went through a long tunnel, and uh, at the end of the tunnel was an incredible, unbelievable sight. There were acres, like football fields and fields of film burning. Tons and tons, tons of film, all burned, burning. 
destroyed. Hearing about another secret cache in Rüdersdorf, outside Berlin, Bud drove there immediately in the hope of finding the films intact. But he was too late. Again, the potential evidence had been set alight shortly beforehand. At the very least, it's a remarkable coincidence that we have all these film fires in such a short period of time. It is likely that there was a systematic policy to destroy incriminating film. But it's quite comparable to what they did with um, other evidence of crimes. Despite the trials having been postponed for logistical reasons, the Schulbergs found themselves in a race against time. It was imperative that they find other archive stocks before Nazi sympathizers managed to destroy them. And now, in November 1945, courtroom 600 of the Palace of Justice was just about ready for court proceedings. The brothers had just found out about another hidden cache, but its location in the Soviet zone of occupation complicated matters considerably. Major Evan Arias, I never forget him. And he said, I don't understand this. Uh, you, why is a young naval officer coming here in, into the Soviet controlled part of Germany? I, I just don't understand what you're doing. So I said, Well, it's, it's a long story, Major, but uh, we're part of the, of the, um, of the uh, uh, Commander John Ford's. Uh, I got about that for far, and he said, John Ford? In one word, he said, John Ford? He said, you know John Ford? And I said, God, we work. he's our boss. Well, I, he says, I, he says, like, I have written two books about John Ford. <laughs> he, it turns out that this man is the biggest expert on John Ford in the world. <laughs> He, he, he wants to know movie by movie by movie, every single one. He got so excited, he said, remember that shot in Young Abel Lincoln when, when Henry Ford has his foot up on the desk and really do anything for us. He said, and he actually said, like, bring a truck, you can take anything you want. Certainly there were some efforts by German lackeys to destroy evidence. It's not clear what was destroyed. Uh, that was all stored in Babelsberg uh, is so interesting because uh, the, he had the keys to the kingdom. This list, drawn up by Bud Schulberg for his superiors, includes a number of documents that his new friend, Major Avenarius, had agreed to hand over. Among them, a speech by the Nazis' leading racial ideologue Alfred Rosenberg, that would later be a key factor in his conviction by the tribunal in Nuremberg. Further footage would likewise prove invaluable for detailing the regime of terror unleashed by the Nazis following their rise to power. Crucially, it consolidated the charges of criminal conspiracy and premeditation. A big event yesterday. Rudolf Hess was brought to our projection room to see himself and the other top Nazis rant and roar in triumph of the will. He gave a perfect imitation of a man who has lost his memory, by which he hopes to escape any punishment. Attention, the International Military Tribunal will now enter. November 20th, 1945, a date that would go down in history the opening of the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg. 218 days of hearings, 5,330 documents, 236 witnesses, and countless hearings, simultaneously translated into four languages. 21 defendants took their places. A further three were absent. One had committed suicide, another was on the run, and the third was judged medically unfit for trial. Chief American prosecutor Robert Jackson now knew he could count on the films prepared by the Schulbergs to make a big impression in court. The privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. These defendants arrange frequently to be photographed in action. We will show you their own films. 
you will see their own conduct and hear their own voices as these defendants reenact for you some of the events in the course of the conspiracy. The real complaining party at your bar is civilization. Jackson explique qu'il va précisément montrer les films nazis. Jackson explains that he's going to show the Nazi film specifically because the dignitaries, the defendants, had ultimately been so vain as to have themselves filmed. He explained quite precisely that the court would be able to hear the words of the defendants and see them on screen. To revisit particular episodes of the conspiracy and see how they were planned. Du complot, du plan concerté. Prosecutor Jackson had also insisted that the court proceedings themselves be documented on camera. What he had in mind was a comprehensive movie record recounting the principal phases of the trial to act as a model, an antidote to fascism. Jackson first turned to the older Schulberg brother to direct the film. Bud, however, was eager to get back to New York to focus on his own writing projects. So the job was left to Stewart to create the first full-length film of the trial, which would become a template for future real-life courtroom films. No easy task, given that cameras and sound equipment at the time were bulky and noisy, and several judges thought that their presence would disturb proceedings in court. As a result, the equipment was largely kept isolated behind glass panels in positions specifically converted for the occasion. There are basically three cameras. One of them in the glass booth to the left of the judges, which enables sound to be recorded in sync with the images. Another camera is positioned on the opposite side, to the right of the judges, making it possible to film both the defendants and objections from the prosecutors. And finally, a third camera is placed in a booth, again for reproducing sound and images. Four hundred journalists from around the world had come to Nuremberg to observe the trial. But with the highly detailed hearings further slowed down by the simultaneous translations, the interest of the media appeared to gradually wane. Prosecutor Robert Jackson therefore decided to move forward the screening of the Nazi atrocity films by a few days. Stuart Schulberg also checked the lighting conditions. For Jackson, it was vital that they capture the reactions of the defendants watching images of their crimes. During a dry run, we discovered that the neon tubing was throwing too much light and turning the image milky on the screen. A little frantically, we began to stretch some mending tape across the tubing. At 9 o'clock, the defendants were already being led into the dock. As I was nervously securing some tape, Goering and Hess were led in through the back door. I blocked the route of Goering, who was still wearing high black boots. Goering saw the tubing, looked down at me and said, Kinema, nine? Hess, who was still feigning insanity at the time, went into his act, clapping his hands together. Goering smiled and shrugged his shoulders at me. Half an hour later, those smiles were wiped off their faces. If the tribunal please, we shall proceed with the projection of the film. On November 29th, the first film prepared by the Schulberg team was shown to the court. An hour-long montage of footage filmed by Allied forces during their liberation of the concentration camps. These are the locations of the largest concentration and prison camps maintained throughout Germany and occupied Europe under the Nazi regime. This film report, covering a representative group of such camps, illustrates the general conditions which prevail. The 
Camp is chosen for a high command inspection led by General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Also present are Generals Omar N. Bradley and George S. Patton. The 4th Armored Division of General Patton's 3rd Army liberated this camp early in April. They see the woodshed where lime-covered bodies are stacked in layers and the stench is overpowering. The general and his party next see the crude woodland crematory, actually a grill made of railway tracks. Charred remains of several inmates still lay heaped atop the grill. I was 21 or 22 years old. It was very disturbing at the start, even among the defendants, who could no longer say that it hadn't happened. Those images of corpses being hauled away by bulldozers, it was appalling. That must have been a real shock. It was quite the shock. It was a smart move by Jackson, showing these terrible images very early on in the trial. This was Bergen Belsen. As the lights came on, I stared like everybody else in the courtroom at those 21 men. Field Marshal Keitel wiped tears from his eyes. Von Ribbentrop, the elegant diplomat, who had always had an answer for everything, looked down into his lap and shook his head. Military commanders Reda and Dunitz stared straight ahead, unseeingly. Rosenberg leaned his forehead against the top of the dock. Even Goering, who had been winking, scoffing, laughing, and catching the eyes of fellow defendants in private jokes, looked subdued at last. But the most unexpected reaction of all was that of Hans Frank charged with the murder of five million Poles. When all the other defendants had finally risen and passed through the doorway on their way back to their cells, Frank continued to sit there motionlessly until guards began to lift him up forcibly. He is, uh, uh, he is really moved. I have to admit, nearly crying. He should have kept this crying and admitting what he has done. Do you think they, they never saw this, this footage before? Because you, as you I don't, I can't say it for all the other defendants, but I would say it uh, Nearly, I'm 100% sure that my father never had seen this before because he didn't want to see it. He knew exactly what was going on, what was happening to the, all these innocent people. But to see it personally, like here in this room, that was really new for him. You don't think he had any remorse? No, he had not. On the last evening of his life, he wrote to Mr. Seidel, his lawyer, and to his wife, our mother, saying, please find out the truth about me. I never was a criminal. On December 11th, the court was shown the second film prepared by the Schulberg team, which they'd barely finished editing. Four of the most mighty of nations with the support of 15 more to utilize international law. With a running time of three hours and 15 minutes, the Nazi plan provided crucial evidence for the assertion that the war and the atrocities committed by the Nazis were premeditated. The footage in the film still plays a major part in how we picture this era. Even today, most documentaries made about the so-called Third Reich go back to footage that was systemized and gathered for that film. So 
I mean, uh, the, the work of both of the Schulbergs for, for their project at that time cannot be overestimated in their uh, long time uh, uh, effect. The prosecution's case continued, also using the meticulously reconstructed timeline from the Nazi plan. The subsequent examinations and cross-examinations extended to weeks and months. The prosecutors wanted to show the world that despite the enormity of the crimes, justice had to be impartial. For a trial that would last almost a year, the decision was issued by the judges, by the tribunal, that the filmmakers must only film during uh, 35 hours. The camera teams inside this courtroom were U.S. Army camera teams. They were not from the OSS as originally planned because the OSS was closed down. So the U.S. Army Signal Corps, um, they, they took over. Um, they are a unit to provide telecommunication and other communication. And their camera teams were not able to speak German. So another big problem. They were filming, sometimes they were um, catching some very important scenes, sometimes not, sometimes they were st stopping too early. So the problem was um, the film material that survived and that uh, Stuart Schulberg could pick out of um, was not very good. But Stuart Schulberg found a solution. On the sound side, the court sessions had been captured in their entirety on gramophone records. Film editors Bob Parrish and Joe Zygman helped Stewart master what was a colossal task. He was able to use silent footage of the various parties merely listening to proceedings by overlaying it with sound bites. Ich möchte nochmals betonen, dass ich über militärische Maßnahmen nichts wusste. Ich, und wenn ich es gewusst hätte, hätte ich nicht die geringste Veranlassung, etwa hier zu sagen. While Stuart Schulberg was toiling away in the editing suite, the Soviets were also determined to include the trial in their national narrative. They undertook their own project, entrusting the task to cameraman and director Roman Karmian. In the ensuing battle for control over the historical record, these images would play a decisive role. The Soviets managed to negotiate a special day of filming, showing events before the session began. Roman Karmian found a prime location, which provided him with an entire series of close-ups that the Americans had been unable to take. These shots had a particularly dramatic effect, as seen on October 1, 1946, when the verdicts were delivered by the court's presiding judge, Sir Geoffrey Lawrence. We'll now pronounce the sentences on the defendants. The International Military Tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Twelve of the defendants were condemned to death, three received life in prison, four received terms between 10 and 20 years, and three were acquitted. Of those sentenced to death, 10 were executed two weeks later at the prison adjoining the Palace of Justice. Hermann Göring had committed suicide in his cell the night before. Martin Bormann was sentenced in absentia. Stuart Schulberg would need almost 18 months to complete his movie documentation of the tribunal. And his work was delayed considerably by differences in opinion among the U.S. authorities over the purpose of the film. He would have to write 11 different versions of the script before being able to tackle the actual editing of the footage. It was now early 1947. While Stuart Schulberg was still in the middle of editing his film, his Soviet counterpart, Roman Karmien, had completed his documentary in Russian titled, Judgment of the Peoples. In English, simply, the Nuremberg Trials. The Soviets also landed something of a coup in hosting a premiere for their movie in the heart of New York, Times Square. The local press was highly critical of the delayed completion of the American film. One of the big battles that took place was whether the film should be made just for a German audience or whether it should be made for an international audience. The people in Berlin with military government really felt that it should be, its primary use should be as a denazification, re-education tool. Stuart Schulberg really felt, uh, if you look through the documents, that they were making a film that was not just for Germany. They felt that the Nuremberg trial was 
a milestone in the history of civilization and that the whole world needed to learn the lessons of Nuremberg, not just the German public. Navigating his way between these conflicting instructions, Stuart Schulberg finally finished his film in early 1948, one year after his Soviet counterpart. Lord Justice Geoffrey Lawrence, Great Britain. Mr. Francis Biddle, United States. Monsieur Henri de Vab, France. Major General Yona Nikichenko, USSR. And their alternates... Stuart Schulberg's 80-minute documentary recounts all the stages of the Nuremberg trials, made at a time when the Soviets, Americans, British, and French were still ostensibly allies. Nuremberg, its lesson for today, was a powerful and necessary film. It presented pivotal moments in the trial, as well as archive material compiled by Stewart and Bud Schulberg for Chief Prosecutor Robert Jackson. On April 23, 1943, SS Chief Himmler ordered the complete liquidation of the ghetto with the use of utmost force. The film also included footage taken during the liberation of concentration camps by the American, British, and Soviet armies but the wider world would not get to see the film. In June 1948, West Berlin was cut off and blockaded by the Soviet military. The Western Allies had to resort to an airlift to supply the part of the city they controlled. The Cold War had begun in earnest. Uh, that same Cold War, uh, in which now, of course, Germany was, or at least Western Germany was our ally, and our former ally, the Soviet Union, was now our enemy. Not at all the story portrayed in the film. Um, uh, the film conflicted with that, that narrative. But Stuart Schulberg's film did get its premiere in Germany in November 1948. Not in Berlin, due to the Soviet blockade, but in Stuttgart. After the success of the first screenings, the American release was scheduled for a few weeks later. But in the meantime, the climate in Washington had changed. It had been two years since the Nuremberg trials concluded, and the implementation of the Marshall Plan was now a top priority. During the Marshall Plan, uh, millions, and millions and millions of, of dollars were invested in not only in Germany, in the whole of Europe, but also in Germany um, to help them recover their economy, um, to bring them forth. And this, of course, collides with the idea of, of punishing war criminals. In December 1948, a fateful decision was made. The film's release in the U.S. was cancelled. The humanitarian goals of prosecutor Robert Jackson, Stuart Schulberg, and his entire team, who had put so much hope and energy into the film, were dashed by the new political situation in Washington. It wasn't just an accident that this film was not released in American theaters. It was a government decision. And that decision was made by our Secretary of the Army at the time, Kenneth Royal. There were a number of high-ranking American officers who did not feel that prosecuting high-ranking German military leaders at Nuremberg was appropriate. They felt that they were the ones taking orders from Adolf Hitler, and they did not consider themselves responsible for the Nazi crime. So there was some degree of solidarity amongst German military officers and American military officers. As I was growing up, I really knew nothing about my father's Nuremberg film. My mother died in 2002, and when we were clearing out her apartment, we found all these boxes of material about Nuremberg, and we found a 16 millimeter print of the film. So I began to try to make sense of the papers. Sandra Schulberg spent almost 10 years reconstructing her father's film, a mammoth undertaking that required locating the original movie reels and restoring them. Both the images that had degraded over time and the audio, part of which had been lost. 
Today, Sandra travels the world to present the film, now translated into 13 languages. As I was re-watching uh, Nuremberg's lesson for today, what's amazing is to see how prescient uh, Jackson was. I mean, tragically uh, prescient, really. He says, what makes this inquest significant is that these prisoners represent sinister influences that will lurk in the world long after their bodies have returned to dust. We will show them to be living symbols of racial hatred, terrorism, and violence, and of the arrogance and cruelty of power. They are symbols of fierce nationalisms and of militarism and intrigue and war-making. Unfortunately, we still have a lot to learn. <laughs>